Hello, I'm Richard Sever from Cold Spring Harbor Lab and BioArchive. With me, I have Adam Pataputian from the Scripps Research Institute. Welcome to Cold Spring Harbor. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, you gave a fascinating um, talk um, the other day, and um, I was Thank interested you. that um, you, you, you lamented during your talk that you had not had two or three glasses of wine and that you spoke much better after two or three glasses of wine. Now I, I know that you've <laughs> had two glasses of wine because we've just been at the, um, the, the, picnic, at the picnic. Yes. So, um, yeah. I feel good, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm looking forward to seeing how this conversation goes. Excellent. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed your talk and um, you talked specifically about the roles of the PSO1 and PSO2 receptors uh, in mechanotransduction. Um, can you sort of paint the big picture of mechanotransduction in biology for us before we kind of discuss the roles of the receptors? Absolutely. Um, you know, in biology, cells mainly communicate with each other through chemicals and uh, whether this is hormones like insulin being secreted or neurotransmitters like dopamine that go from one neuron to another and uh, from signal transduction pathways, everything almost we study in biology is chemical signaling. Um, and of course that's true, most of signaling is in mm -hmm. uh, chemicals, but one area that's kind of been ignored by biologists is this idea of the sensing physical forces, you know, uh, temperature, pressure, how do you sense this? And is there, you know, more active kind of signaling that translates physical forces into chemical signals that cells and uh, mainly neurons that we initially studied sense and transduce this information? Um, and there are some biological processes that are you know, clearly we know dependent on mechanosensation, for example, touch, pain, sensing blood pressure, hearing, uh, all of these have been studied for decades um, from their physiology. People have, you know, especially in the nervous system, people using electrophysiology have recorded from these cells and they know that there are these proteins and ion channels, specifically these very fast signaling molecules that membrane indentation is enough to activate it without the presence of any chemical signaling to initiate a signal. So the existence of the, these channels were known for decades. What was missing was a molecular identity. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we brought uh, by cloning these piezo ion channels. Uh, specifically our question was how do you sense touch, how do you sense pain? And that's how the whole work started. And so um, you mentioned the membrane curvature. So that's, is that the critical piece, the curvature of the lipid bilayer that does something to the protein so it knows that there's a deformity of its environment? Yeah. So mechanistically, it seems to be actually sensing membrane tension. So this could uh -huh. be by curvature. Um, it could be by just changing lipid composition, which change the tension profile of the membrane, which make it easier by stretching or indentation or fluid flow. So all of these people thought about as different mechanical stimuli. One is, you know, blood flowing and endothelial mm -hmm. cell sensing. One is indentation on my fingers that starts mm -hmm. the touch sensation. But it so happens that they all sense membrane tension. Uh -huh. And this one group of molecules that we identified um, can sense all these forms of mechanosensation because they have a common uh, activation mechanism, and oh. that is any type of tension on the membrane. Okay, so and what, what does that look like at um, the molecular level? One of the things that I was kind of interested by in your talk was that these receptors are huge. Did, well, was I right? You said 38 transmembrane Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so most ion channels have like two to six transmembrane domains mm -hmm. because they sit at the plasma membrane and they have to sense it. So it makes sense that they have to have transmembrane. Uh, but this molecule has 38, which is um, actually more transmembrane domains than any other protein in your genome. So oh, they, wow. they win the prize in number of transmembrane domains. And as I said, on top of it, they come together as trimers. So right. um, again, uh, 38 times three, I'm not even gonna do the math right now, but it's a large <laughs> number so of- 108 then, yeah. <laughs> A large number of transmembrane domains spread out in the membrane, which makes them prime to sense any change in the physical uh, dimensions or tension of the membrane so they can transmit that information to the central pore uh -huh. and activate it. So ion channels, um, very fast signaling molecules, but right. they're very simple at heart. They're either closed or open. 
Right. And so if they're closed, nothing's happening. If they're open, ions are flowing in. And which uh, ions are flowing? And these are cation it's channels. So it could right. be calcium, could be sodium, depending on oh, okay. what cell type needs that signal. Um, but yeah, once that happens, the rest is kind of the, the neuron knows how to take like care of that. regular neuronal signaling. Absolutely. And um, one one thing that was interesting, I mean, we, we think of like proprioception being the, ob the obvious case. Um, yeah. Um, but it's, there's many other tissues that are in, in involved in, well, not involved that require mechanosensation. You mentioned blood. What you were you were talking um, specifically about the the lung, um, and an adipose tissue in your, in your talk. So what, what what's going on in the lung? Yeah. So let's start with proprioception, which you said you know is well known. I actually I, I think that's one of the most fascinating senses because. Um, obviously, you know about it, I know about it, but uh, most people, even most scientists, don't know what it is, which is mm -hmm. quite remarkable. So proprioception, for those who don't know, are instead of sense of touch, which is very intuitively, we know what it is, you t I touch my fingers, I sense it, it's the same but for muscles, so how much from, but the sensing, what we're feeling, is not the equivalent of touch. It's mm -hmm. kind of transformed into from how much each muscle is stretched you kind of get the idea of where your limbs are in space. Right. And so that's how I can close my eyes and touch my nose despite three glasses of wine. Right. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's so important, but people don't realize it. I mean, people call it the sixth sense sometimes. Yeah. But it's a, it's a sense that we take for granted, I think mainly because we can't turn it off. Yeah. You know, uh, if you're not being touched, you know it, you can close your ears and not hear, you can close your eyes and imagine what the world would be like without uh, sight. Yeah. But proprioception is always there. Yeah. So, you know, Richard, you, you know what space you occupy. And yeah. so all, all because of little stretch sensors in your muscles. And, and it all has to be balanced. I, I mean, I think every, anybody who's been through, I, as I did for sporting injuries, is physical therapy, you know, yeah. and you have to retrain. That's is, exactly. Is that because yeah, people call it balanced. muscle memory, they call yeah. it all kinds of things, but that's what it is. And again, you don't realize it till you lose it. That's why these individuals who don't have PSO2 that mm. are deficient in proprioception, uh, such a profound phenotype. Many of them can't stand up or walk, um, mm. or or do any of the things that we take it for granted. And it all comes down to pressure sensing by these ion channel PSO2. So, I mean, so you showed from. some sort of remarkable um, uh, illustrations video, yeah. of people with deficiencies. Yeah. So the, the the balance is is off. What are what are the other um, aspects of the phenotype that you see in these people? So yeah, we're still. This is an active area of research, so they don't sense touch, they don't sense proprioception. One interesting anecdote is that peop the, the clinicians who treated them didn't know that they lacked sense of touch and proprioception until the genomics folks cloned it, found oh, out it's wow. PSO2, and they said, wait a second, there's all this literature in the mouse that without this you don't sense touch and proprioception, because the diagnosis before that was motor neuron problem or uh -huh. muscle problem. So in the clinic, this is what doctors mainly think about. Of course, the circuitry needs a sensory component for those right. outputs to be uh, you know, obvious and visible, but nobody thinks about the sensory. So in addition to research, this has really raised, I think is raising um, just attention to the fact that you know, the sensory nervous system is very important for these phenotypes that people observe in the in the yeah. in the, well, in I the mean clinic. A great, great illustration of like the power of genomics for revealing the the true molecular yeah. cause of a absolutely of a deficiency. and you know for these patients just realizing that they have this deficit there's clear ways for them to uh, compensate for it for example visually people who don't have proprioception um, I showed you when they're mm -hmm. you know blindfolded they can't walk at all in the reverse, if you use your visual system to keep looking at your feet and your legs while you're walking, you'll do much better. So without drugs, without even therapy, just that idea that your visual system should compensate for that um, lack of sensation really seems to help. But you also asked what else is problematic with, with these folks and uh, anything intuitively that you think about pressure sensing, they have um, they have deficits in, for example, you and I know when to go to the restroom because we f mm -hmm. feel a full bladder. So they completely don't have this sensation because it's again, mechanosensation. As the bladder fills, you have sensory endings innervating it, 
just like the ones in the skin and the muscle that tell you it's time to uh, empty the bladder. Right. So right. they don't sense this, and they have to. They've learned to go to the restroom two, three time, two to three times a day to make sure there's no accidents, and the list keeps growing. They have, you know, lung stretch is sensed, so they have issues with that. They have gut transit issues because there's lots of yeah. movement in the gut. So wherever there's movement in your body, these molecules seem to be playing an important so role. So in, in the lung, it, it, what, how does that manifest? In the, they have trouble breathing, just the regular breathing, um, or is it the rhythm of the breathing that's Yeah, so there seems to be two aspects of it. Um, one is there is this reflex that all medical students learned called the herring brewer reflex, mm -hmm. and it's a stretch-induced apnea. So it means you take a very large breath, you stop breathing, not mm -hmm. to cause injury of overinflation. And so this is gone without the PSO2. How this manifests is that your breathing pattern is different. Mm -hmm. You end up taking larger breaths, for example. This is not a big deal, but during perinatal time, both in the individuals without PSO2, and we've seen this in the animal models as well, they have serious breathing problems. And mice actually die because of this. Mm -hmm. Humans survive because we have very good perinatal treatment in right. medicine that we don't have in mice. Right. So in the perinatal time, this breathing uh, deficit is a major issue without PSO2. Oh, okay. and, and so, uh, you know, as well as um, uh, the lungs, you also talked about fat cells, um, and that was kind of where it seemed to be like almost um, a different frontier. Right? Yeah. It, it wasn't clear to me what, what's going on in fat cells. Why do, why do fat cells uh, need, yeah. need mechano sensation. Yeah. So um, I talked about this a little bit. I, th the way I think about it is that, you know, till now, which I called stage one of what we're studying, you were checking boxes. Right. For example, we knew that touch depend on mechano sensation, and we said check it's PSO2. You know, mm -hmm. we were saying oh bladder stretch, we know it's mechano sensation dependent. Check it's PSO2. Those are areas where we knew pressure sensing was very important. We yeah. even had recorded from these channels before we even cloned it, and now we found a channel and shown with genetics that they're important. Mm -hmm. um, but meanwhile, we found out that these channels are what I call professional mechanosensors. They don't do anything else. So I've worked on a lot of other channels before, and most of them are polymodal. Right. So for example, the heat-activated channel also responds to pH. So mm -hmm. you can't for example, look at expression of V1 in the kidney and say, oh, there must be noxious heat in the kidney. Of course, it never happens because yeah. it responds to pH. These guys evolutionarily conserved professional mechanosensors, which means anywhere we see their expression or function coming from clinical data or whatever tells you there's mechanosensation there. Right. And so we've kind of been now starting to use piezos as kind of as a fishing tool, as a tool almost, to look for this idea that I presented in the beginning, which is cells mainly sense chemicals, but how about mechanosensation? Mm -hmm. And we're finding more and more surprising roles of piezo in places that we didn't think about. And fat is a prime example of this. Uh -huh. When you think of fat, you think of very soft tissue. Why would you sense mechanosensation? But we are, again, this is work in progress in a way, mm -hmm. but we're finding out that there are actually neurons that innervate the fat, and they sense some mechanical force in there, and they use this information as a negative feedback loop to control the motor sympathetic output that right. controls how much you burn fat, how much you store fat. Uh -huh. um, now, what is the mechanical stimulus that they're sensing? That we don't know yet. Yeah, no. Uh, but just from looking at where those endings are, we have some clues. One of them is that it seems to um, go all around blood vessels innervating fat. And we know that blood vessels are going to play a very important role. If you want to store fat, you want more blood flow, etc. So then blood vessels you know, will inflate, mm -hmm. get bigger, and so mechanosensing becomes more intuitive there. Yeah. But it's just one example of how our, you know, we have evolved We've made these channels, and then physiology and evolution uses them in all kinds in, of unexpected places that we never thought about. 
Yeah, well, I mean, it's fascinating to hear those stories of, you know, you, you start off going from the physiological function to find the molecule, and then now you're going in the other direction. Yeah, absolutely, the, yeah. The fishing e expedition. Yeah. So, um, you know, we wish you luck with further fishing expeditions. It's awesome. been fascinating talking to you. Thanks very much. Thank you Adam. so much. Thank you.